Well, good morning, everybody. We are so glad you came. So glad you made it out to this important occasion. If you could find your seat, please, and let's get ready for service. That would be great because the sound in here is kind of really loud. So if you're in the back and you're talking, we're all going to hear you, and we're going to point fingers. Not really. Uh, it, it is a delight every year, and we have nine people to be baptized today. Isn't that something to praise the Lord for? Amen. That's awesome. So we're going to stand here, and we're going to sing together, How Great is Our God. Would you stand with me, please? Thank you so much. You may have a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Justin. If I haven't met you before, welcome. We're so glad you come out for our annual baptism service. I'm going to kind of go over a schedule of what we're going to be uh, doing, okay? So after I get done with announcements, we're going to sing a couple more praise songs, and then I have what I'm going to call a sermonette. It's a, a shorter sermon. Josh is going to hold me to that, right? 15, 20 minutes, okay, sermonette. Then after that, we're going to dismiss, and we're going to let all our um, people who are being baptized, we're going to change, and we're going to go down to the water. We're going to meet down there, and then we're going to have our baptism uh, part of our uh, service. And then after that, we're going to have uh, food, fellowship. So the ladies have um, made a wonderful, uh, what is it, a taco bar? A taco bar that we're just going to enjoy. And so we'll just enjoy some uh, food and fellowship. And then after that, if you would like to, this wonderful facility, Pine Ridge Bible Camp, if you want to uh, go down and swim or you want to use some of the facilities with your family, you're more than welcome to do that. All right? So that's kind of a schedule. 
of uh, what we're going to have this morning. I got a couple announcements um, here. Next Sunday after uh, the service, we are going to be going to Grand Haven Beach. Um, this is organized by our outreach committee, so if you have any questions about it, you can talk with Betsy Sanderson. Um, lunch will be provided, so it's just a, a fun time to be able to hang out. So that is next Sunday, August uh, 27th. Also, uh, we're blessed to have uh, um, some missionaries of ours, the Pierce Bakers. We're going to have Alicia and uh, Nadine uh, Pierce Baker. They're going to be with us next Sunday, and they will be sharing um, in our Sunday school hour. Um, and the missions committee, Dr. Al, I believe he wants to have a short meeting um, right before we eat with the missions committee right here on the porch. So if you're a part of the missions committee, if we could just have a short meeting um, after, after uh, we do our baptism time there. Um, Denise. Okay. All right. So this is an announcement for our ladies retreat coming in the fall. So I am reading this here for the first time. Sign up for Women's Retreat September 29th through October 1st. $25 deposit due this week. Please drop it off at the church office so we can get it mailed in. Full payment of $155 is due September 10th. We'll be sending an email link out this week so you can also register online. If you are in need of assistance to pay for the retreat, please let us know. We do have some scholarship money set aside to help out. And with that being said, if anyone in the congregation would like to help out with the cost of the retreats or women's ministries, just make a donation um, on your check or envelope and we will put it in good use. Was that all right? Okay. All right. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Other announcements? Um, you can check them out in your bulletin. Let's pray and let's get to singing. Lord, we're so thankful to be here for just such a joyous occasion. What a beautiful day you have blessed us with. And as we're just going to be celebrating um, these nine individuals who have dedicated their lives to you and, 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 and just what represents of, of baptism is, is new life. And we are so thrilled to be able to celebrate uh, this day. So I pray now that you'll just be with us as we sing songs to you and as we're going to be looking in the book of Acts, uh, just of some of those, the early church and the baptisms and how joyous they were of the new life that they had in you, Father. So we just pray that you would just bless our time together. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Please stand as we sing a little more, How Great Thou Art. Oh Lord my God.
nothing. Almost makes me want to just put the guitar down and let you guys sing a cappella. We're going to do one more called Our God. to invite you, if you have your Bibles or if you have your phones, if you would turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And in this chapter, we have Peter, who preached a message to a crowd of several thousand about Jesus, and he was convincing them that they had been wrong about Jesus, that they killed him thinking they were just getting rid of a public nuisance, but in reality, Jesus was dying for their sins. And this was proven by the fact that God had raised him from the dead. So check out verse 37 of Acts chapter 2. Let's read together. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. It just penetrated, it just convicted their hearts and said to Peter and the apostles, they said, brothers, what shall I do? What shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. 
With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So here you have Peter, he preached the message and he drew a line in the sand regarding Jesus. And that day, 3,000 knew what side of the line that they wanted to be on. It says they were cut to the heart and their lives were changed and they wanted to be baptized to show that. And we see this scenario actually happen over and over again in the early church, in the book of Acts. In chapter 8, an Ethiopian government official is riding along in his chariots, reading from Isaiah, and he's confused. When the Spirit of God directs a guy named Philip to join him in the chariot and explain to him that Isaiah's prophecies are all about Jesus Christ. The eunuch becomes convinced Jesus really is the Messiah. And Acts 8 says, As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders, Stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. You notice it says, Down into the water. Philip didn't stand beside the pool and scooped water out and drizzle it over his head. He dunked him under the water, okay? In Acts 9, a man named Saul gets confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus. This was a man who was completely opposed to Christianity up to this moment. He literally infiltrated Christian circles, took them to jail. He even murdered Christians. But then one day, in a way he wasn't expecting, he met Jesus. He heard about Jesus, but on that day he met him. Jesus knocked him off his saddle and he saw the truth. And a disciple named Ananias invited him into his house. And when Saul could see again, it says he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. So his baptism took precedent even over lunch. You notice that? He ate food afterwards, which shows how important it is. In Acts 16, we're told of an influential businesswoman named Lydia. She was a female entrepreneur. Think of a CEO of like Burberry or something like that. And she attended one of Paul's evangelistic small group Bible studies. And it says the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message and she and her household were baptized. In Acts 18, a man named Crispus, a religious leader in the Jewish community in Corinth, a man you thought would have it all together. He's a religious leader whom everybody else assumed had it all together. But he encounters Jesus through Paul's preaching and realized that day that his religious upbringing was not good enough and his life was still empty and he needed Jesus. So Acts 18 says, Crispus and his entire household believed in the Lord and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. And I could go on and on in the book of Acts about how many different baptisms there were. So what I want to do this morning is go back to that first baptism in Acts chapter 2 and look at what Peter said to them and why they responded the way they did. So two questions we're going to look at from this first baptism. The first is, what was it that he said that cut them to the heart? And then, what did they do in response? So why were they cut to the hearts? Two things Peter said to them. First, they realized that they had been wrong about Jesus. At this time in history, there were many different theories floating around about who this Christ was. Some of these theories were fueled by what they wanted or expected Jesus to be. Some wanted him to be a prophet, calling people back to religion. Others wanted him to be this great political messiah, delivering them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. But Jesus would not conform to anybody's expectations. He kept doing things that would blow up their categories. He forgave people's sins, something the Jews thought was blasphemous. He let people worship him, saying that if they didn't, the rocks and the trees would cry out in praise to him. He claimed he was replacing the temple as the center of worship. He demanded absolute worship over his followers, to be more important to his followers than even their own families. And people started saying, it's like this Jesus thinks he's God. 
And Jesus said, you said it, not me. And what's more, he said, I'm on a rescue mission to save people from sin. And the only way that you can have salvation is through me. And people were like, Jesus, I mean, we like you and all. You're a good guy, but you got to be quiet about all this God Lord stuff. This could end up being very bad for you. And he wouldn't, and they ended up crucifying him. But Peter says, by the resurrection, God overturned the people's verdict. Acts 2 says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So if you're taking notes this morning, write those words down. Lord and Messiah. It's in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. So what does Lord mean? Lord is a common title for God. Not just another religious prophet. He is the Lord. He's the creator of the universe. And Messiah means the one who fulfilled all the promises about salvation. Jesus is Lord and Messiah. There's not one way to be saved among many, but the only gate through which we can enter heaven, the only name under heaven given to us by which we can be saved is through Jesus Christ. And Peter says, hey, you guys had an opinion about Jesus, but God overruled your opinion by the resurrection. When you got two guys in an argument and one rises from the dead, I think he wins, doesn't he? And that's what Jesus did. And so now, Peter says, you have to change your opinion. In the same way, I think many of us today have something we want or something we expect Jesus to be. Maybe it's most convenient to think of him as just a great religious teacher. I mean, he's a great uh, social justice model, isn't he? Maybe you think he just has a great moral influence over your life. He's the foundation of Western morality. Maybe you say he's one of the many ways to know God, but we can't be certain that he's the only way. For many today, they might look at Jesus as a get-out-of-hell-free card. Someone who can save you from your sins, but he doesn't have much impact on your day-to-day -day living. For many in church, he's more of like a good luck charm. Someone you can turn, into, uh, turn to in a jam or someone who helps you find success in life. But Jesus would not let himself be relegated to any of these categories. A few years back, I saw an NPR in an interview with a guy by the name of Bono. And I feel like I didn't used to have to explain who Bono is. He's the lead singer of a popular uh, band called U2. Remember, popular back in like the 80s and, and, and 90s. And in this interview, uh, the subject of Jesus came up. Now remember, this is on a public news station. And the most fascinating conversation came about. So here's what Bono said. He said, the secular response to Christ's story always goes like this. He's a great prophet. Obviously, he was a great, very interesting guy. He had a lot of uh, things to say, uh, along with the other great prophets, uh, be they Elijah or Muhammad or Buddha. But actually, Christ says, no, I'm not saying I'm a teacher. Don't call me a teacher. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. I'm saying I am God in the flesh. And people say, no, no, Jesus, please just be a prophet. Prophet we can take. You're a bit eccentric, but we've had John the Baptist eating locusts and wild honey, so we can handle that. But not God, not the Messiah, because you know we're going to have to crucify you if you keep saying that. And he goes, no, no, I actually am the Messiah. And at this point, everybody starts staring at the ground and saying, oh my goodness, Jesus is just going to keep saying this, isn't he? So what you're left with is either Christ is who he said he was, God incarnate, the Messiah, or Bono says a complete nutcase. He says, I mean, we're talking nutcase on the level of Charles Manson. He says, I'm not joking here. And the idea that the entire course of civilization for over half the globe could have its fate changed and turned upside down by a nutcase, for me, he says, that's just a little far-fetched. And that's basically what Peter said. Jesus claims to be Lord and Messiah. You tried to re redefine him, but he wouldn't have it, so you took his life. But then God overturned 
your verdict with his own by the resurrection, declaring Jesus Christ to be both Lord and Messiah. And he says, you have to choose. Choose today, is he who he says he is, or is he who you say he is? Because there's really only two sides of the line. You're either submitted to Jesus as Lord and Messiah, or you have rejected him. Lord means a surrender. There's no such thing as a partial surrender. Just as there is no such thing as partial faithfulness in your marriage. If you accept him, he must become Lord of all. And he says he's the Messiah. He's the only hope that we have for salvation. And if I were to ask you this morning, why would God allow you into heaven? What would you say? You know what the most common answer is? Well, I'm a basically a good person. I mean, I'm, I'm better than others. I'm a good person. God would let me into heaven. But as we talked about last week in 1 John, none of us at our core are good people. We all are sinful. We all need a Savior. And Acts 4 tells us salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So the people Peter was speaking to, it says, were just convicted. They were cut to the heart because they realized they had been wrong about Jesus. And they were also cut to the heart because they realized they were actually responsible for the death of Jesus. A couple times in Acts 2, Peter points to the crowd and says, you killed him. Now this verse at times, tragically, has been used anti-Semitically, claiming the Jews killed Christ and they should be held responsible for it. But that's a very poor understanding of Peter's meaning here. First, when he says you killed him, he was speaking to the whole human race. Not just the crowd there. Also, not everyone there had been directly involved in Christ's crucifixion. So he's really looking to all of us and saying we all had a part in putting Jesus on the cross. Peter even includes himself in that number. You see, on the night that Jesus was crucified, remember, Scripture tells us that Peter had denied Jesus three times. And on that third denial, Luke says that Peter looked up, and immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed, then the Lord turned and looked right at Peter. You can imagine what was going through Peter's mind at that time as Jesus stared around and looked directly at him. Jesus' face by that point would have been bruised and bloody, and Peter would have realized at that moment that Jesus Christ was being beaten for his sins, for Peter's sins. And it says he was cut to the heart. He wept bitterly over that. And I think that we are cut to the heart when we realize that it was our sin that put Jesus on the cross. And when you see Jesus looking at you, you know that Jesus is saying, hey man, I died, died for you, each one of us. Salvation occurs when you personally are convicted of your sin, and there's no other way but then to run to him for forgiveness. So scripture says they were, they were cut to the heart over their sin. But secondly, what did they do? So they were convicted, they were cut to the heart, but what did they do? Verse 41 says, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So they were baptized. But why would baptism be the right response? You see, baptism is a symbol that Jesus left for the church. It's like a ceremony identifying with him in his death, raised to new life in his resurrection. We know that symbols and ceremonies, of course, have no value apart from the commitment. Illustration is my wedding ring, okay? If I were to take it off, I still am married to Jesse. This is a symbol, an outward sign that I am married and I am committed to her. So what does baptism symbolize? It pictures that our death, our burial and resurrection with Jesus Christ. And honestly, it's one of the most important practices in the church. Now, I've heard people say, well, that's your opinion, Pastor, I don't think it's that important. I don't need to be baptized to love Jesus and to follow him. And I always want to say, excuse me, have you read what scripture says? Do you not realize that this is a commandment that Jesus gave to us? It's not an option. 
before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his followers to make disciples and to baptize them. So choosing to be baptized is an, active, uh, is an act of obedience to Jesus Christ. We know Jesus himself set an example by his own baptism. Jesus' willingness to be baptized serves as, serves as an example to all of us as followers of him. In baptism, we follow in his steps. It's also a testimony that you identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You declare that you no longer live for yourself, but now you seek to live for Christ in dependence and obedience to Him. I also love how baptism just unifies us as Christians. Your baptism is a witness to other believers that you are a member of the body of Christ. There's believers all over the world, and it unifies us, the worldwide community of believers. For many people, the experience of being baptized can strengthen your faith. It can solidify your commitment to live the rest of your days as a follower of Christ. So we are excited this morning to have nine baptisms. Woo! Give a round of applause. But before we go down to the water, I'm going to have Emily. She wants just to share a little testimony here of how the Lord has worked in her life and how excited she is to be baptized. Emily, thank you so much uh, for sharing. Okay, now we're going to be transitioning. So we're going to have our, everybody who's going to be baptized. We're going to change into our uh, swimming uh, attire. And we'll meet y'all down uh, by the water. And we'll have our service down there. Okay, so meet you down there in about five, ten minutes. Okay, everybody. All right, we're going to get started here. I'm going to try not to get stoned. All right, so we have all of our individuals are going to be baptized over here. They are they are ready to go. What does baptism represent? It represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there's a great truth that we have as Christians. When Christ died, he died in our place. He died our death. This means we're not the same people that we once were. Our old self has died. And because he was buried and conquered sin 
in the grave, we too can have a newness in life through Jesus Christ. We know nobody stays under the water when we baptize them. I promise not to keep you guys down for too long. But when you rise out of the water, it represents after Christ's death, rising again to new life. The old self of unbelief, rebellion, died when we are united with Jesus Christ. And for each one of these individuals who met with them and heard their testimony, they have chosen this morning to die to themselves and let Christ take control of their lives. They personally accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior and desire to follow Him in obedience. So our prayer this morning is that Christ would richly bless their obedience and cause them to grow in their faith and be a testimony for Him. They've committed to walk in the newness of life, and they would like to publicly show that they have died to themselves and now are committing to be servants of God. So I'm going to have them one at a time. They're going to join me out uh, there, and we're going to do this. Tia asked if she could do the, the slide there down. I said, no, not this year. All right, so, all right, okay. Come on out, Caleb. This is Caleb uh, Kremschreiter, and um, it's been a privilege to have him ever since he was small and in Awana, and now he's in youth group, and just see how he's grown in his relationship with the Lord. And we mentioned baptized. He was one of the first ones who said, Pastor Justin, sign me up. I want to uh, be baptized. So we're so thrilled to have him making this commitment to the Lord uh, today. So... Caleb, have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Uh, yes. How do you know that you are a child of God? Uh, because John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Is it your desire today to be baptized? Uh, yes. So Caleb Kremtrider, on confession of your faith in Lord Jesus Christ and in obedience to the command of God, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tia, she's another one who's just been uh, known her since she's been little and grown up in our, our programs for the youth, and and she just was excited about uh, being baptized. She's going off to Grand Canyon University next week. Yeah. All right, she's excited about that, a new adventure, but she's excited about being baptized this morning. So Tia, have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. How do you know that you were a child of God? 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10 says, But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people, you are a loyal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. All right, very good. So is your desire to be baptized this morning? Yes, sir. Tia Edelman, upon confession of your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in obedience to God, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Confession of your 
faith in Jesus Christ and in obedience to the command of God, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. that you were able to share your testimony um, earlier. What an encouragement that is to us. Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. How do you know that you were a child of God? From the testimony I gave. From the testimony you gave. Amen to that. Is it your desire today to be baptized? Yes. All right. Emily, upon your confession of faith in Jesus Christ and in obedience to the command of God, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. family. Have you received uh, Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Toby? Yes. How do you know that you are a child of God? Galatians 3.26 says we are all children of God through faith. All right. Amen to that. So is it your desire this morning to be baptized? Yes. Tobias Rowan, upon confession of your faith in Christ Jesus and obedience to the command of God, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dame here, he's excited about being baptized. He even texted me this last week and said, I'm so excited about Sunday, Pastor Justin. Um, so we're uh, excited to, to baptize you. And uh, Dame, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. How do you know that you are a child of God? Because John 1 12 says, to, to all who believe in and accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen. Is it your desire this morning to be baptized? Yes. Dame, upon your confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in obedience to the command of God, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
and uh, called her on the phone and just it was just a privilege to be able to talk to her and see how the Lord's worked in her heart and uh, how she wants to become involved in, in church and how she's uh, just accepted Christ as her Savior. And uh, so we are thrilled to be able to baptize you this morning, Allison. Have you received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. And how do you know that you are a child of God? Uh, first off, uh, God is in my life every day. Second, uh, John 3.16, God's love the world, but we are the truth, God's son, and we shall have a good day. Amen to that. Is it your desire this morning, Allison, to be baptized? Allison Barr, on behalf of your confession of faith in Christ and in obedience to the command of God, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to uh, enjoy this lovely facility here. So let's bow together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for such a lovely day you've given us. Thank you for just this. Um, we, we've seen the, the commitment that each of these individuals has uh, made to you and this newness of life. And we're thankful that uh, they have made this uh, commitment to you and, and showed us all what an encouraging morning this has been. And we just pray now that you would uh, bless our food uh, to our bodies and the fellowship that we are uh, going to have and that uh, we would just honor you um, with our lives. And I would challenge if anybody hasn't made that commitment um, to be baptized that they would just consider that. And uh, we just are so thankful for what you did for us on the cross and you rose and can offer us new life. So we pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right.